Welcome to the Neckbeard Experience. This is a special compilation. I decided not to do this in like a series. I wanted to do it all in one. So I just recorded the whole thing and got it all together at once so that you guys had the full story. You don't have to wait for months and months before I get it done. So I hope you guys enjoy. Without further ado, I present to you Pajama Beard. Chapter 1. The Beard in the Striped Pajamas This is an account of my hellish summer experience I had with a beard. I'll call him Pajama Beard. The cast, me. I'm a 17-year-old straight female who has an unhealthy obsession with trout fishing. Pajama Beard. He's 22 years old, a straight male, who wears those shirts with the howling wolves on the front. You know the ones. Dan. He's the boss man. He owns the lodge that I work at. And he witnessed my encounter with Pajama Beard. The summer went off the typical way by my personal standards. I was out of school, which was a junior year, going into senior year. I packed up my truck and drove four hours to a campground. It's nestled in the eastern Sierras. I worked there and lived there for like three months. During that time, I cleaned the cabins and run a tiny bait and tackle shop. It's a beautiful place. It's got the cleanest, coolest waters you'll ever drink. This place is my safe haven. It's a refuge, if you will, from my hectic home life. A place where I can make money, fish, and totally be off the grid and cut off from the outside world. There's no cell service up there. Zero disturbance or distractions. However, this summer, it was destined to be one that was extremely trying. All thanks to none other than a neckbeard. I had gotten to the campsite and literally just got handed the keys to a small summer cabin by Dan. When I noticed a very large RV, it was crossing a small bridge over the creek. He was heading toward the campground. I mean, this sucker was huge. It had the full package. At least it seemed. It must have cost an arm and a leg. Dan turns to me and says, Hey, October, get your stuff unpacked and get settled in. I'm going to watch this dummy try and bring this behemoth in. I simply replied, All right. I head back to my truck so that I could pull next to cabin two which is the one I was staying in. By the time I hopped in and turned the key, the look on Dan's face went from enthused to downright dumbfounded. The massive RV was not pulling into the campground. It was attempting to pull into the small circle drive right in front of the tackle shop where guests check in. These clowns weren't campers. They were actually lodging in one of the cabins. Realizing quickly that I would be in the way of this monster, I put the truck in drive and hurried to my cabin. I unpacked pretty quickly because I'm used to packing light and very organized. Seeing that I officially don't work till the next day and therefore hadn't been paid, I didn't bother to buy fresh groceries, yet I did have canned stuff and non-perishables. I decided to take the opportunity to go fish so that I would have rainbow trout for dinner. So I rigged up my pole put on my boots, tied my knife on a loop to my jeans, and set off to catch dinner. At first, the fishing was uneventful. I had caught two decent sized rainbows when I heard something crawling through the bush. I noticed toward the clearing, a flash of blue and green fabric run by. I say run, probably a brisk walk at best. Once I stood up, my eyes unknowingly beheld what would be the bane of my existence for the next three months. About 15 yards in front of me, stood pajama beard. He had on green and blue striped pajama pants. They were about three sizes too small. And he had a graphic wolf t-shirt on with the image of a wolf howling on the front on the edge of a cliff. Ah, classy. The sunlight had caught the top of his head, giving this ratty looking black hair an unholy glossy shine. And when he turned toward me, it looked like he had hair from your privates haphazardly glued to his rotund chin. I kid you not, he had a full unibrow. Noticing my apparent shock, Pajama Beard grew nearer, and he spoke in an obviously fake deep voice. What's a fair girl like you doing out here by yourself in the woods? No one had ever questioned what I was doing, in any way whatsoever, not even in a rhetorical way. Anyone with a quarter of a brain cell could quickly tell that I was fishing. I replied shortly. Fishing? Then I asked him. Why are you running around in the woods in pajamas? There's stinging nettles around here, you know. He retorted with, 
A man like me has nothing to fear, especially with my abilities. It took every fiber of my being not to bust out laughing. This five foot eight, 300 pound butterball in pajamas had nothing to fear in the woods with no internet to save him. Yeah, right. But I held myself together and replied simply with, Okay, but seriously, be careful. 11 hikers have died up here in the past few years because they were caught unprepared. Oh, I'll be fine. Still making the crappy deep voice, he says. After all, they're probably just human. I stopped walking for a moment, floored by what this guy just uttered. Stopping was a huge mistake. I could smell him way before he reached me. This guy had major B.O., even over the smell of salmon eggs and trout. I could smell him because of the pungency. It was ungodly. He spoke again, keeping up with my now hurried pace, desperately trying to escape his foul range. Hey, hey, normal man. How I know or surviving in the woods would be a problem. I could hear him huffing as he walked the altitude with a fake deep voice. But I'm not, I'm not just like any normal man. So it's not a problem for me. Like I said, I have abilities. <laughs> Is one of your abilities an inability to breathe through your nose? I asked this trying not to laugh at my own joke. I do that too much for my own good. He seemed stunned by my crack, almost as if he couldn't believe that a fair my lady dared to question him. I'll have you know, he said awkwardly, grabbing my shoulder with his meaty hand, physically spinning me around. I'm a lichen. You'll regret saying that, I swear. You better hope that I'm not hungry tonight. I wish this wasn't what he said, but it was verbatim. I could say nothing. I just stared in sort of disbelief. Then I removed his clammy hands from me, and I hurried back to my cabin. After reaching my cabin, and firmly locking the door, I observed through the window, Pajama Beard waddling toward his cabin, the one which the overkill RV pulled up next to, the one that I would surely have to clean by Friday. I could only imagine the smell, after a week's worth of filth and B.O., which undoubtedly would make me gag. That evening, when I was out back cleaning two trout, I caught what I swore I heard someone's weak attempt at howling in the nearby woods. And I do mean weak. I did my best to ignore it, still confused about what happened earlier. After cleaning the trout, I lugged the water bucket, full of innards and blood, toward the wood's edge, away from the cabin so wasp wouldn't disturb the guest. As I dumped out the bucket at the base of a large pine, I saw out of the corner of my eye none other than Pajama Beard eyeing me from behind the large pine. Except it wasn't quite large enough because his belly was clearly visible even after he ducked behind it. Deciding in that moment that I wanted revenge for the cringe interaction earlier and the weird threat, I grabbed my knife, removed it from its holster, then I proceeded to smear it in blood. And as quickly as I could, I stalked over to the large pine, came up on Pajama Beard, who was hiding. I crept up toward the tree, till I heard the heavy mouth breathing. <laughs> then I said aloud, What the hell do you think you're doing running around in the woods in the dark? I said this simultaneously, as I whipped around the tree with the bloody knife. <laughs> Pajama Beard was already quite pale. And when I did this, he looked like a ghost. Without a word, he turned on his heel and he waddled for his life back to his cabin. Oh. So much for being a big, bad, strong werewolf with abilities, right? Chapter 2. That's not a gummy worm. Two days after my arrival on my summer job, I began working as a cashier in the tiny bait and tackle shop. My job here is pretty simple. I ring people up and try to sell them whatever overpriced fishing bait we have. Also snacks and sell them firewood. It all goes fine for two days. It's open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Plus an hour before and an hour after, I clean some of the cabins and also do ground maintenance. If Dan asked me to, around noon to one o'clock, I usually go fishing. 
The third day begins pretty typical. Cabin 13 needs to be cleaned. So I scramble over there. I scrub it from top to bottom because guests were supposed to arrive at 11 a.m. Due to how strange the cabins are arranged, there's only a small privacy line of trees. From there to cabin 17. And that's the one that Pajama Beard and his parents are residing. I haven't seen Pajama Beard since I spooked him two days earlier, so I think nothing of it. And I continue to do my job. Unfortunately, as I'm rushing to leave 13, I was running about 10 minutes late. I glance over at 17, which I shouldn't have done, and I notice that 17 shades are open. 17 has two nice big windows on the front. I could just make out the pudgy figure staring at me, knowing full well who it was. I looked away and increased my already fast pace back to the tackle shop. I clean up the tackle shop, then 12 o'clock rolls around. And note, I still haven't got fresh groceries yet. So after eating, I go fish. I end up catching my limit in about 30-ish minutes. I found two really nice holes with a bunch of hungry trout. On my way back, I stop by my cabin and put my catches in a cold bucket of water. Grab some homemade elk jerky that was made by a family friend. I walk toward the shop entrance in a good mood. Then it took an immediate 180. Standing in front of the door, waiting for me, was Pajama Beard. Damn. I thought to myself internally. I thought I scared him off. He looks toward me in a droning voice. I've been waiting 15 minutes. The sign says you're open at 1 o'clock. Sorry. I replied bitterly. Yeah, my dinner doesn't catch itself. I don't really exactly recall what he said. Something how girls aren't really good at hunting and fishing, at least not as well as men, or some crap like that. As he was talking, I noticed that he was still wearing pajamas. Again. Oh yes. I replied sarcastically while opening the door. I could smell him again, real bad this time. Oh, I'm sure someone with your abilities is more than capable of providing your own food. Pajama Beard picked up on my sarcasm, and while I turned the lights back on and took my place behind the counter, he droned on about how his abilities were nothing to joke about, saying something like, I only spared you two nights ago prior because you are a fair young maiden. You obviously made a simple foolish mistake. Since I'm wise and merciful, I decided not to provide myself with a human meal. So I elected to consume a young doe instead. Never in my short sweet life, thus far, have I ever felt so much disgust and secondhand embarrassment at the same time than with this guy, both belittling and praising me in the course of a few sentences. Upon finishing his monologue, he came to the counter, clutching a cherry Pepsi and three bags of Cool Ranch Doritos. I rang him up, and he noticed the elk jerky sitting on the counter. I'd been snacking on it while he was blubbering. How much? He asked in a stuffy voice. Not for sale. I replied. Oh, I insist. He said, shoving a wad of bills in my direction. They smelled like a sun-baked porta potty I cannot sell you my elk jerky as it is homemade and not a store item. I replied, now growing agitated. Elk jerky? He asked. Then he stared at me with a newfound interest. While he was doing this, I was counting his change, though I could still smell his money on my hands. Ooh, you like elk? He asked. Yeah. I said. Better than beef. I see. He said with a sort of creepy, fascinated voice. Well, if I can't have that, then I guess I'll take a free gummy worm. He then proceeded to grab this gummy worm. Uh, uh, sir? I tried to warn him. He cut me off, trying to be smooth. Call me Pajama Beard. Pajama Beard. I replied as quickly as he would allow me. That's not a gummy worm. Too late. This experienced and skilled hunter just chewed and swallowed a mouse tail. Not a literal mouse tail, but it's a trout bait. It's trout bait. The fearsome predator went from ghostly pale to a shade of green. Then he proceeded to speed waddle out of the shop, taking his kill of Doritos and Pepsi with him. 
As soon as the door on the shop closed, I laughed hysterically. And I couldn't stop until I started to choke. The afternoon went calmly, until a shrieking voice filled my ear. Have you ever heard an angry stellar blue jay? Well, imagine that. Except that ear rape edition. That's what this woman sounded like. Dan then appeared in the shop doorway, and this lady is still screeching. Your employee tried to kill my son. She fed him fish food. I was dumbstruck by what I just heard. Then Dan looked at me dead in the eyes and said, October, did you give this woman son bait and say it was a gummy worm? I paused, still in shock at what I was hearing. Then through gritted teeth, explained how Pajama Beard had ingeniously grabbed the bait and helped himself to the soft rubbery insides. The woman scoffed at me and called me a lime pig, then demanded that I apologize. Not wanting to be sent home only three days into my three month work trip, I reluctantly apologized. First to his mom, then to Pajama Beard himself, who had extremely red and watery eyes. In my head, I thought, Has the little been crying? But I said nothing out loud. But instead, I just shot him one of the dirtiest looks I could muster. Once they were satisfied with my apology, they left, causing the building to shake a little. Dan, of course, asked me again what happened. I did my best to explain the entire event, starting with me opening the store late, to Pajama Beard eating the mouse tail. After all was said and done, Dan chuckled a little, and he let me off a few minutes early, for the trouble as he put it. In hindsight, I shouldn't have apologized. I should have let Dan fire me and send me home right away, because later events, Pajama Beard would go from gross to annoying to persistent borderline sexual harasser, and he made it his goal by summer's end to make me his mate, all because he would take my love of elk, but all meat in general, really, way out of context. Chapter 3 Snowstorm Sucker Punch It was Friday night, about two days later. Clouds had built up pretty thick, and it dropped below freezing at night. According to Dan, a storm was blowing in, and there was a 75% chance that there would be snow that night and into Saturday. Now, I'm no fool. When it comes to the outdoors, I know what I'm doing. I had seen the clouds early, so I busted out the snow chains and put them on my truck, as well as bare skin gloves and a heavy parka. Sudden snows in June is not uncommon in the eastern Sierras. I could tell it was going to be a nasty one. This is what I was talking about when I mentioned the 11 hikers. The storms come out of nowhere. One day you're wearing shorts, and the next day, heavy snow gear. That's just how it works in the Sierras this time of year. However, Pajama Beard and his family was not so outdoor smart. They were caught woefully unprepared in this last minute snow blast from an otherwise mild winter. Friday night, I decided to sleep in the living room of my cabin. The cabins are not at all insulated, and the heater is right next to the couch. I removed my roll of biscuits from the freezer, got me some elk sausage, and pulled down some gravy mix, which I intended to warm up for myself for breakfast and lunch the next day. I sleep in my light sleeping bag, because I don't want to sleep on the couch by itself. It's pretty gross. In the morning, I woke up and I could feel the cold from the moment that I zipped down the side of the bag. Looking out of the window, I could see the snow coming down, like the icing on a Cinnabon cinnamon roll. It was thick and piled waist deep. Well, waist deep from the perspective of a 5'4 female. I'm still cold despite the heater, even though it's trying its hardest to keep me warm. I quickly get dressed and attempt to gather up some snow gear while the biscuits were baking, heat the gravy and the sausage on the stove top. All the while, I'm digging through my bag for my boots and my ice bikes. When I hear a hard knock on the cabin door, to my surprise, it's Dan's son at my back door. I didn't even know he came up. I open the door with a blast of cold air in my face. Hey, can I come in? Jack asks. Okay. Yeah, sure, hurry, it's cold. I say to him, and he clamors inside and shuts the door. I don't 
don't start work for another 45 minutes. What's this about? Sorry. I know it's before your workday starts, October, but, uh, we really need your help. I say nothing and look at him, and he continues. The people in cabin 15, they don't have any snow clothes. We don't have any four-wheel drives, and the RV's definitely not cut out for that kind of thing. Would you be willing to drive down there to town, buy some stuff for them like snow jackets, stuff like that? Obviously, they're paying, but you're the only one who can drive down there, so... Would you be willing to help us out here? Dan says he'll pay you for the gas and the extra work hours. I wanted to scream at this point. These idiots almost got me fired three days prior from this, and now they want me to drive down the mountain in the snow to buy them crap because they're too dim-witted to bring it themselves? I know I had an attitude when I responded. It wasn't aimed at Jack, but at this point, I couldn't help myself. Fine, I'll do it, but I'm eating my f breakfast first. After my biscuits and gravy, I stepped outside. I now see why Jack came to my back door, as the front door was piled with snow. I forgot to put down salt. I trudged over to the tackle shop and confirmed with Dan that it was indeed Kevin17 that was asking for help. Something to note since we're up in the mountains, Dan offers a sort of pickup delivery service, permitting the guests to pay for what they want to be picked up. That way they can stay on the mountain and not worry about it. I'm sure if I hadn't been there, they would have regretted that hardcore on this occasion. I then make the reluctant walk over to cabin 17. I have a pen and a pad shoved into my glove. That way I can write down exactly what they need. I knock on the door, and what seems like an eternity, the door finally swings open, and in the doorway stands Pajama Beard's morbidly obese mother, who seems to like hairspray and bacon, but not the good hairspray. You know, the crap from the 80s that makes for a better flamethrower than hairspray. And she ushers me inside. The place smells like a homeless orgy. I mean, just absolutely foul. There are wrappers and paper plates strewn about and more empty soda bottles than floor space. I could smell food being cooked in the kitchen. The bacon, it had been burnt for sure. And a faint smell of ham, it was definitely burnt as well. When it comes to meat, I'm a bloodhound. And you can't hide that crap from me, especially when it's been overcooked, even a tad. The whale then opens her mouth and begins to list off things that seem almost never ending, beginning with a snow gear, then moving into food, lots of it. I mean, 24 packs of soda, donuts, as well as party sized chip bags. And that's just mentioning a few. By the time she had finished, she had taken a seat on the couch and seems, almost dared to say, out of breath. I glance down at her and see something that I wish I wouldn't have. She was picking food crumbs out of her bra and eating them. And the action of doing that caused her clearly too tight shirt to move up and exposing her enormous pale and bloated belly. It was disgusting. I look up from this as quickly as possible. I go over the list again and she confirms it. I of course ask for the money to buy this feast and she looks from side to side. Then she screams. PJ, where's my purse? There was a moment of silence, then a response. It's in here, Mom. I'll bring it over. From the kitchen waddles Pajama Beard, wearing a shirt this time with a growling wolf, which is also too small for him. And just like his mother, his belly too is sticking out. His face looks like a grease trap, and he's stuffing himself with burnt bacon. He somehow managed to jump to his greasy unibrow. His smell, however, is too much for the meat to mask. And he gets uncomfortably close. So close that he's nearly spitting in my face, saying, So, uh, so we meet again. Then he hands his mom the purse and declares, I have something to add to the grocery list. All right. I respond. What do you want to add? Then he gives me a nasty grin and says, <laughs> Jerky. And nothing else. Uh. I respond mildly confused. Any particular type? Nah. He responds, I think I may have cringed because he was attempting to be sly because he said, Whatever type the lady likes best. I turned red. I know I did, but I wasn't embarrassed. I was livid. This pig almost had me fired and was attempting to smooth things over with one of my favorite snack foods. Little did I know, he was trying to do more than just smooth things over. I simply said, 
Okay, I think your ham is burning. I wheeled around and got out of there as quickly as possible. I don't even think I shut the door. The drive down and shopping went smooth-ish. I got a lot of stares with all the food in my cart, and it was extremely awkward trying to explain why I was buying the stuff to the cashier. But I survived. I had some trouble finding clothes their size. I ended up having to drive out of the way just to find some. Beyond that, all was okay. I ended up buying myself some baked goods. I ended up getting some sourdough bread from a bakery, and also a pull-away cake. Also, I went ahead and did my shopping while I was out. By the time I was heading back up the mountain, it was already past noon. I had burned through half a tank of gas, so I ended up just filling up the tank. After all, Dan promised to pay for it. Upon my return to camp, I unloaded my groceries, then ended up driving my truck up to cabin 17. They simply had too much crap to carry up there feasibly, and surprisingly, the unloading process was pretty easy. I thought I was actually out of there clean. Just when I'm about to leave, Pajama Beard's voice fills my unprepared ears. I think you forgot something. He said again, with a grin on his face. I look down and he's holding the bag of jerky that I bought, and he extended his arm. Here, take it, it's yours. No, no thank you, I'm fine. I say quickly. I then exit the cabin, because freezing to death is much better than talking to this freak. To my dismay, he follows me out waddles after me through the snow, desperate to keep up. Finally, after he keeps persisting, I turn around. Dude, thanks, but really, I'm fine. He catches up to me, and I can see very clearly that he is huffing now, and now his breath is visible in the cold. Look, he says to me in almost a whisper, I know what you are, but I promise I won't tell anyone. I'm confused now, and I simply ask, What? He continues his whispery, creep-fest voice. I know you're like me. That's why we don't get along so well. He paused. I'm speechless. I know I've invaded your territory. You might see this as a threat, but I didn't mean to upset you or disturb you. So take this as my peace offering. Again. He has stretched out his sausage arm, attempting to hand me the jerky. This time, I accept his peace offering, stepping closer to him, and I grab it. He then says, You know, I think you and I, we should talk some more. Maybe come back up here, and I'll show you the inside of my RV. If you know what I mean. Then without saying a word of warning, I give this man the hardest gut punch that I have ever delivered to any human being to this day. Before he could cry or say anything else, I took my peace jerky and left. I remember thinking that that sucker punch would surely end our interactions. Boy oh boy was I horrendously wrong. This beard, who had somehow convinced himself that I too was a werewolf, would from that moment forward, would simply be more inspired to take me as his mate. In hindsight, he must have been into the BDSM crap, because no one who's mentally stable would take a gut punch like that and be interested. Chapter 4 Hunt for Red October It has been an entire week since my last encounter, and I'm on top of the world. I have caught my personal best stream trout two days after the snow melted. Three pounds, which is big for a stream trout. And I've been bringing and smoking trout and selling it at the bait and tackle shop. If you've never had smoked rainbow trout, you're missing out. Because if it's done correctly, it is honestly really good. But I digress. I was busy cleaning the cabins, raking out infinite amounts of pine needles, and doing other general stuff around the camp. I had gone down to the town one more time to let my boyfriend and my family know that I'm still alive. And yes, I did clean Pajama Beard's cabin. It took me two hours longer than usual, cause it was an ungodly amount of soda that was soaked into the carpets. And the stove, it was covered in grease. Surprisingly, my punch was not protested, and Pajama Beard's mother, she hasn't come screaming to my boss, more than likely. Pajama Beard was too ashamed of himself to tell his mother that a mean girl had punched him into next Tuesday. At that point, I thought for certain he was gone, that I'd never have to deal with this disgusting whale wolf again. I was right for a week, but only a week. It was a crisp Monday morning. 
I woke up early to fish. Anna make breakfast. I watch a doe and her fawn. Eat grass. They had grown into the foundation of the old lodge. I finally got some really nice sunrise pictures. It was the glacier flooded with pink light. I made a tiny snowman. From the very little remaining snow. All is right with the world. And I suppose, after fishing for a little while, I head over to the shop to talk to Dan. So as it happens, there's no cabins to clean for that day. And Dan was content running the shop. So he gave me the day to live a little. So that's just what I did. I packed myself a lunch, geared up my hiking stuff, went for a day hike. It was beautiful. The glacier waters were turquoise. It was so peaceful up there. You almost forgot that down that mountain was a world full of people. By the time I make it down to the camp, it is mid-afternoon. I've gotten kind of hot in my hiking clothes, so I elected to change and fish for the rest of the day. I should have stayed on the mountain. I walked past the bait and tackle shop and overheard a conversation. There was a somewhat nice BMW. It was pulled up front, and I heard a voice almost recognize. That conversation went as follows. She's an employee. I can't give you her employee information. But we really had a connection, and she said that you would give me her number. October never told me that. Can't you just trust me and at least give me her email? Not until she tells me herself, which means her tell me face to face, not for you. Well, then I'll just go find her and ask her then. Okay, good luck with that. She went on a hike today, though. Well, she'll come back down eventually. At this, I dash for my cabin and I lock the doors. This creep was trying to get my number from my boss. I sit in my cabin, staring through the front window for about two hours, waiting for the BMW to pull out. Thinking that the coast was clear, I emerged and headed down the bridge so that I could go fishing. I make it past the bridge, and there's a small parking lot for hikers. And to my horror, Pajama Beard is parked there, and it's too late. He's seen me. I make a beeline to the brush along the creek, but I hear his voice hey, due October. to the fact I wasn't born in a barn, so I stop. I've been hunting for you all day, October. I never told you my name. Your boss told me that much, but he wouldn't do me a favor. Favor of what? He wouldn't give me the honor of giving me your number. My phone doesn't work up here. None do. So there's really no point in that. Also, I'm not single. Now surprisingly enraged. So you took my jerky that I bought with my money, fully knowing that you had a boyfriend? I think you mean your mom's money, and yes. Also, just because it's yours doesn't mean I owe you anything. It was a gift. But... A grossly long pause. I want you to be mine. So badly. We're both lichens. We should have a family. I would hunt and provide for you. And you would stay at home in the den and raise our pups. It would be perfect. Okay, I'm going to let that statement soak in. Well, i give you a little bit of backstory. In my junior year, i.e. the summer before, I had an interesting experience with a group of lesbian weebos. You see, they too was convinced that I was a werewolf, but for different reasons. And they put this together after a few months of me feeling bad for them and talking to them. Through the course of our conversations, they found out some things about me and compiled them into sort of a manifesto to prove my guilt of lycanthropy. The list was somewhat like this. 1. I'm allergic to silver. I actually am because it makes my skin green and it smells gross. 2. I'm colorblind. Again, I am, but just a little bit, like reduced sensitivity to red light, but I can still see reds. 3. I like meat, raw. Okay, again, this wasn't wrong. I like meat tartare, but most of the time, I like my steaks blue. And yes, I do like sashimi. 4. I don't really sleep. This one was only kind of true, because at the time, I was slam studying for an AP test. Number 5. I'm kinda hairy for a chick. This one is embarrassingly true. If I don't shave my arms, they're hairier than my boyfriend's. So yeah, 
this was a thing that they spread as a rumor, and some people actually bought into the theory. I'm still awaiting my trial at the Weeb Court. Anyway, back to Pajama Beard. After his weird fantasy confession to me, and a statement of wanting to make me his own, I simply said, You're f sick. And I hightailed it into the bush. Pajama Beard wasn't able to follow me though. I know he tried. And after crossing the creek, I was able to escape him. For the time being. Chapter 5 Like and Love Letter It's been a measly 72 hours since my last run-in with Pajama Beard, during which he confessed a rather disturbing fantasy. After that run-in, I was a little unsettled. This guy was crazy, saying this stuff almost to a complete stranger. He might not have a conscience at all, and he could take it a step further next time. So I decided to provide myself with a better means of self-defense. Note for clarification. I am by no means a gun nut. I have a Smith & Wesson 22 long rifle, CTG, which means 22 is the caliber and CTG means cartridge. And the name suggests that it's a rifle, but it's a revolver. This is what you would truly call a ladies gun. 22 is a small caliber. It makes it easy for someone with smaller hands and a weak grip to fire accurately, which is why I own this particular model. Now the legal age, in the lovely state of California, is 21, which means it's entirely illegal. I understand this, and I usually keep it hidden away, in case that I have to defend myself. So I took it from my well-hidden spot, in my truck, which was in its case, to my nightstand, but well out of sight. Doing this makes me feel substantially better, and I'm back to myself in no time. So, three days later, I'm feeling good washing sheets, probably inhaling way too much Windex, and I'm cleaning cabin 15's windows. Once 15 is clean, I move all my supplies back to the shop, and I wait for guests to arrive. They check in around 11 a.m., so I end up cleaning the shop. I sell two smoked trouts in that time, waiting for some poor soul to buy a Twix bar. That was definitely expired. It's a few minutes before 11, and I hear the doors open. With a bit of a start, I look up. And to my absolute horror, it is Pajama Beard. He's clutching something made of paper in his left hand. And in his right hand, a breakfast burrito. With more cheese than anything else, there was a good three quarters of a burrito left. And I watched in shock as this hog ate it in three huge bites. Looking him over, it almost seems as though he had somehow gained some weight. I know that he definitely packed on some pounds since I first met him. I could have sworn that he was heavier than he was three days ago. My nose was promptly hit with this ungodly scent. It took all of my willpower not to throw up. Hello, October. Fancy meeting you here on such a fine day. He's spewing chunks of breakfast while he says this. Hello, PB. Are you here to check in? If only I was, that would be divine. But your reservations are full till next month, probably because there's someone so beautiful working here. I would call Dan more handsome than beautiful, and if you're not here to check in, then I cannot talk to you. I'm working, and guests are set to arrive shortly, so whatever it is, please make it snappy. He looks at me somewhat disappointed, and proceeded to stretch out his left hand to me. The piece of paper wasn't actually a piece of paper, but it was a sweat mark sealed envelope. For my lady. I almost lost it, because no one has ever said that to me before. It made me want to crawl into a hole and die. I then proceeded to reluctantly pluck the letter from his greasy palm using the thumb and index finger pinch technique. Uh, thank you, PB. Now I have to get back to work. Before Pajama Beard could say anything else, his stomach made the loudest sound I have ever heard a stomach make. You probably could have heard it, even standing outside at the pond. That's how loud it was. <laughs> I guess it wasn't enough. For... what? For burritos. I should have gotten six, and maybe three extra hash browns, instead of ordering just two. The burrito that I watched this guy consume was not a small burrito. It looked like a full one pound burrito. That means he already ate four pounds worth of burrito, plus three servings of hash browns, if I'm correct in assuming. 
He got one hash brown with the feast and ordered two extra, but regardless, this guy consumed a minimum of five pounds worth of food just for breakfast. And he's still hungry? Picking out a bit is fine on occasions, like on holidays, but having a feast like that every day is not healthy. Lucky for me, before I could think about this insanity anymore, I already had a young couple appear. My unknowing hero's presence would now save me from the jaws of this obese wolf man. Pajama Beard looks up, then he looks toward me, but I've already begun pulling up the guest book and talking to them with a big huff. <sighs> he waddles out, causing the little shop to rock a little as he went. I get the couple checked in. They must have seen the disgusted look on my face, and they try to make conversation so that they can make me feel better. The kindness isn't lost on me. I thank them for showing up, and when they did, and being so nice, I showed my gratitude by giving them the friends and family discount. In the back of my mind is this envelope, and how it's still sitting on the counter. I'd be surprised if it didn't leave a grease mark. I wanted so badly just to leave it there. But I'm also an extremely curious person, and this time, my curiosity got the better of me. It's a good time later, when I sit down to eat my dinner, I found a really nice porterhouse steak. I prepared one of them in a baked potato with some pan-fried asparagus. Mm. I sit at my little table eating, and before me sits the beard's envelope. Using my fishing knife and a napkin, I dissect the envelope, revealing a piece of paper, which contains some of the most cryptic and disturbing things I've ever read. I'm sitting there eating my steak, and I'm reading the world's most delusional love letter. Now, I wish I would have taken a picture, but honestly, it probably would have violated some Reddit guidelines and would have been labeled an adult post, especially with lines like, I would make you c till you bleed. And if your boyfriend tries to get between us, I'll slice his head off and feast on his corpse. They're forever scorched on my memory. I would have taken that crap straight to the police if it wasn't for the fact was that he was smart enough to type it and not handwrite it. And I would doubt that anyone would actually believe that I received this and that it wasn't some kind of cry for attention or a hoax. But looking back on it, I think the biggest reason why I didn't, because it didn't scare me. Honestly, I thought it was kind of funny. And I recall laughing while I was reading it because of how bold and faked his claims and threats were. In that moment, I felt stupid for ever feeling unsettled by this guy. And that night, I returned my revolver to his hiding spot. I even left my doors unlocked. If he wanted to, I'd like to see him try. The next morning, I woke up nice and early, lit a campfire outside, and cooked some bacon and eggs. My real motive wasn't to have a rustic breakfast. I used it as an excuse to have a fire to burn Pajama Beard's comical letter and to have it contribute to something useful while doing so. However, much like my patience for Pajama Beard's bullcrap, the love letter was nothing more than ashes in a matter of seconds. Chapter 6 The Boy, the Knife, and the Beard It has been four weeks since I received the love letter and it's been pretty uneventful, excluding the fact that Pajama Beard has gained considerably more weight in the past four weeks. His claim is, I'm depressed because you rejected me, so food is my only comfort. However, emotional manipulation has no effect on me, and my hatred for this land well will never cease or lessen. I woke up around 6 a.m., and I'm eager to get my day started. Today is the day that Matt comes to visit. Matt is my boyfriend, and he's about 20 years old. I haven't seen him in roughly two months, so I'm very excited. I even gone down to town the evening before so I could call him. I confirmed that his directions were correct and verified exactly where I would meet him. While I was down there, I also stocked up on groceries. So I make myself some breakfast and I watch the sunlight hit the glacier from a small picnic table by the pond. It's going to be a beautiful summer day. I've got about three hours before he arrives. So I got my casting pole and I rig up a fly. So that morning, I spend about two hours fishing, watching the clock eagerly. I jump in my truck, wave goodbye to Dan, and off I go. 
I am so excited to see him again, so I head down the mountain. I totally ignore the black BMW that drives past me. I should have paid more attention. I get to town 30 minutes early, so I sit in my truck on my smartphone, catching up on what happened over the past two months. Though I use my phone once a week to call my family and Matt, I usually don't look at the news. As it turned out, the world really wasn't that much different. I ended up waiting about 45 minutes. Then Matt finally arrives. After a good makeout session and a whole lot of hugging, we eat lunch and we catch up. I tell him about everything that happened with Pajama Beard, including the love letter. And I could tell that it was making him mad. Now Matt, he's the polar opposite of me. He's a lover, not a fighter. He's a big old teddy bear and a total cuddle bug. He could also be a bit needy and overprotective, but I love him all the same. I switched the topic to a bear I saw a week prior, and the anger drains from his face. He really likes bears, so that's my go-to topic of distraction. After a while, we pay for our meal, and we head back up the hill. Since his truck is terrible at scaling inclines, we take my truck. We park his on the trailhead, and we head up. The drive goes by uneventfully. The look on his face is a mix of terror and wonder as he stares down the sheer cliffs and the beautiful streams. It looks like something out of High Plains Drifter. We get up the hill, and I take him to meet Dan. After a while of chatting, I give him the tour, and I show him around the cabins. As we head toward the last cabin, Cabin 18, I notice something that wasn't there that morning. It was a black BMW. It was the black BMW that I saw on the road. As a matter of fact, it was Pajama Beer's black BMW. Matt senses the change in my mood, and he says, Hey, let's go. You can take me fishing. Sound good? Too late. The behemoth already spotted us, and he's moving out as fast as he can to engage us. God, I hate this f***ing guy. Is that Pajama Beard? Yeah. Pajama Beard then dramatically opens the cabin door. On his head is a black fedora with a red skull with crossbones on it. He takes a slow motion dramatic step and is coming straight for us. The stairs buckle under his massive frame. Each step that he takes, it screams in agony. He must have thought that he looked awesome, but in reality, he looked like a beached well, desperately trying to roll back to the sea. Hello, beautiful she-wolf. His fedora is covering his eyes as he says this. And you? He snapped his head up, revealing his eyes, in which he had clearly inserted vermilion contacts. You're the one who has stolen my love. You are the one who has defiled her with your filthy hands. You who has... Matt cut him off. Dude, listen. I don't know what the hell you're going on about, but she's already told you that she doesn't want you. Now or ever. So why don't you just do us a favor and f*** off? As an attempt to rub some salt in the wound, I pull Matt in for a nice long kiss. Right before we can really get going, I feel a hand push him and I apart. And this hand had not just pushed me, but my right breast. I open my eyes to see Pajama Beard standing between us. His back to me, and he's facing Matt. Now there's only one person in God's green earth that I let touch me in any way, and that is Matt. No one touches me twice and gets away with it. That's when I do something I almost regret. Almost being the key word there. In that moment, I reach down for the thing that's already at my side, my survival knife. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. I remove the knife from its sheath and move it to my left hand, my non-dominant one. I approach Pajama Beard from behind. He's in the midst of trying to fight Matt. Then with my right hand, I clap his mouth shut. His skin and smell were foul, but I was too enraged to care. Then I bring my left hand up, knife still in hand, and turn the blade toward him, allowing the cold steel to graze his flabby neck. Yeah, you know what that f***ing is. So why don't you listen to him and f*** off, or... This time, I take the dramatic pause. Perhaps you'd like me to demonstrate my cutting skills. You can't be all that different from a trout, can you? I could just cut your throat and bleed you out, then split you up the middle just like a fish. And even better, you're up here miles from help where phones don't work and no one can tell your scream from a mountain lion's. A perfect place, too. Matt shoots me a look. I reluctantly stop, lower the blade, then take my hand away from his mouth, shoving him as hard as I could away from both of us. He turns as pale as a sheet. He smells like he might have wet himself. Then he screams. 
You coward! He's shouting at Matt. Tell me I'm your honor! But the pond is gone! No outside influences! He looks at me, then I sneer at him. He quickly looks away. Well, Matt groans audibly here. <sighs> Fine. I'll f fight you. Now screw off. Satisfied that this challenge for my lady's hand had been accepted, Pajama Beard swiftly turns away, making sure to stare at me with his stupid contacts for one last time. Then he marches back up the steps and into the cabin. Matt and I don't talk about what happened. We simply walk back to my cabin in silence. I grab my fishing stuff. He sits and watches as we both say nothing of the incident. I think he could tell that I wasn't in the mood to talk about it. We fish for the remainder of the day until twilight when he catches his first trout. I couldn't have been more proud. I taught him how to clean it and we fried rainbow trout fillets with potatoes for dinner. We stayed up late looking at the stars. After all, it is over 10,000 feet up. And after a while, we go to bed. We end up just falling asleep in each other's embrace. In the back of my mind before I fell asleep was one thought that still remained. Pajama Beard and Matt, they would fight tomorrow and I'll be forced to stand aside and watch. Chapter 7 Pajama Beard Encounters the Finale Duel at Dawn the stupid rooster alarm goes off at 5.45 a.m., but neither of us wants to get up. We both know what the day has in store, and we're not too eager to get it started. After a bit, though, I climb out of bed and hop in the shower. Even after I finish, Matt is still laying down, so I give him a nice wet hair smack to get him up. I make breakfast, and I advise Matt not to eat anything, just in case Pajama Beard, by some miracle, gets a good gut punch. Matt agrees, but he makes sure to set aside a portion for himself. I make some duster stew, which is a mixture of all your leftovers, put them all together into a pot, and then heat them over an open fire. I stir them with a screwdriver. I make a bit more of a refined version, but the promise is still there. And yes, I do use a screwdriver. After that is all said and done, we head out. The sunlight is flooding the mountaintops, and it looks beautiful. Dawn is upon us. Ready for your big fight? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've never been in a fight before. Wait, you've never been in a fist fight before? I got close, like in second grade, but I've never been in an actual fight. Sh well, just put him in a headlock or something. It'll be gross, but that way you won't actually have to fight. Or maybe I should just keep jogging away from him, and that'll tire him out. I wouldn't, because he might think you're conceding and try to do something unsavory with me. Yeah, maybe you're right. I'll go with the headlock plan then. We make the short walk down to the pond, and to our utter shock, Pajama Beard is already there waiting for us. He has abandoned his fedora, but he still has in his contacts. Something to note about his contacts. When I first saw them, I thought they were green. You remember, colorblind. However, Matt later corrected me, and he insisted that it was a bright red, so I'm going with him having the bright red contacts in. Pajama Beard wastes no time to engage Matt. I take up a spot by the pond picnic table, and the fight begins. I know they're saying things to each other, but they're moved out of earshot, so I only catch snippets of what they say. Since Matt isn't generally the aggressor, it's no surprise that Pajama Beard ends up taking the first wing. His punch is almost as slow as his walk, and Matt, he doesn't have to do much more than take a good step back. Matt proceeds to swing back. It's clumsy and far from elegant, but it hits his pudgy mark. Matt worked in construction with his dad for a good two years. So what he lacked in skill and grace, he more than made up for in strength. Pajama Beard's face contorted a bit. Matt's heavy side punch clearly hurt. Pajama Beard swings again, but except this time, he looks like he's going in more for a scratch than a punch. This makes contact, and he scratches the side of Matt's face. Matt, then in an effort to follow through, plans to go for the headlock. To my surprise, he is actually successful. And before I can clearly tell what happened, Pajama Beard is flailing about wildly. That's when Pajama Beard makes his smartest move. He pushes backward against Matt, and he goes dead weight. They hit the ground hard. Matt is unable to clear himself completely of his enormous mass. His right side is pinned under Pajama Beard's now uncovered stomach. Matt wiggles free, trying to kick Pajama Beard's gut on his way out. They landed in the mud. Matt's back is totally caked in it. Pajama Beard must have worn himself out 
because he's unable to lift himself up. He tries a few times, but he can't get his legs underneath him. His stomach is way too fat, and it's forcing his legs apart. Matt walks over toward me, as Pajama Beard lays there, somewhat helplessly defeated. He asks me somewhat jokingly, So how'd I do? You looked like an autistic chicken, but you got the job done, I guess. Well, like I said, I've never actually been in a fight before. I can't say I enjoyed it all that much. I mean, look at me. He turns, revealing the extent of the mud. Don't think this is over, coward! Then he proceeded to hurl a mud ball in our direction. It hits Matt with a smack on the neck. Then a little gets on my sweater. Then all hell breaks loose. Matt is furious. He pounces with unprecedented grace on the beach well, like a mountain lion on an unsuspecting deer well. And he began punching him mercilessly. Pajama Beard is squirming, shouting, Oh, stop! Stop! Causing mud and grassy debris to fly everywhere within a five foot radius. It gets to the point where I've seen enough. So I get up from the table and run over to pull off Matt. Right as I get there, I look away. And in that split second, I see Dan running down the path. He has a hose in his hand. I get out of the way, and he blasts them both with freezing water. Matt springs up and runs back over toward me, so he could avoid being sprayed more. Pajama Beard, however, was unable to get up, so he got blasted a while more by Dan, as Dan yelled, What in God's name is wrong with you two? This is a fishing pond, not a wrestling ring! Eventually he turns off the hose. Dan then promptly scolds them both, telling them, You shouldn't fight like that in front of a young lady! You both should be ashamed of yourselves. I also remember him saying, This may be woods, but it doesn't give you the right to act like animals. Matt apologizes, with Pajama Beard simply standing staring. His nose looks dislocated, and his left eye is severely bruised. After Dan is finished, Pajama Beard grumbles something under his breath, and he waddles off. Dan then goes back up the path, but this time, I had him leave the hose. I do my best to spray Matt off so he wouldn't track mud into the cabin. Then I make him strip down to his boxers, and I sent him for a warm shower. There were some scratches on his face, but nothing too bad. We sat on the steps together, having a good laugh. All seemed right with the world again. I didn't see Pajama Beard again until after that day. The last I saw of him was his black BMW leaving. But after that, I never saw him again. The remainder of the week, we had a great time. Making great memories that far outweighed the bad ones. Eventually, I found myself packing up and going home. Internally, I longed to stay among the mountains, towered over the high plains. In the end, there's something for everyone to learn from my experience, whether it be a lesson on how not to accept rejection or a moral about self-control. There is something here for everyone, and if my recount of summer experiences is enough to even wake up just one individual to their flaws of their own behavior, then I consider the time I took to write this well than worth the time. Thank you very much for joining me for this special edition of the Neckbeard Experience. Hope you guys enjoyed this compilation. I did it all at once. My throat hurts really bad, but it's satisfying. I just hope you guys enjoy it. If you did, it was more than worth the effort. I want to give a special thanks to my patrons. Your help is invaluable. I couldn't say enough. Thank you very much. And if you want to become a patron and support the channel, there's a link down in the description. Or you can make a one-time donation of PayPal or you can buy some of my merch, or just keep on watching. Plus, at least give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends if you can. That will help me out immensely. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram. My wife keeps that up. There's things there that she posts besides just what we put on the channel. So please leave a comment. I really enjoy reading them. It means a lot. I want to give a special shout out to Moon Horse the Horse. I'm going to put a link at the end of this video. He's got neckbeard stories and quite a bit of other stuff. I think he's worth checking out. Again, thank you guys for watching. Until next time, this is Dallas, signing off.